All right. At WGA's annual meeting in Boulder last year, Governor Polis and Go Governor Gordon signed a memorandum of understanding committing their states to work together to advance direct air capture solutions. Capitalizing on unique resources and assets of each state can help advance these technologies at a regional scale. Other approaches, such as DAC hubs, can help maximize community benefits and leverage local and regional expertise. Our final roundtable today will explore collaborative approaches to de developing carbon removal, highlighting how Western states are in a unique position to advance this technology. To moderate this final session, it is my pleasure to welcome back Governor of Wyoming, the Honorable Mark Gordon. Thank you, Abby, and thank you all for being here today. I think it's a mark of a successful conference when people are having side conversations, having a hard time coming back into a room and sitting down. And so really what these are intended to do is to spur that kind of conversation and get people thinking. And boy, I got to tell you, the last couple of uh, panels that we've heard have got my mind thinking. And this panel actually will uh, probably bring uh, all of that to, I just admitted to them, I have no idea where we're going to go. Um, but, but I think that's really a mark of how exciting this time is when you, you think about the problem that we've set out, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the solutions that we apparently have or are in developing, uh, the opportunity set that we can develop that with, and what are the constraints that we look at it. And so if my, my worry has been that we are so binary in how we look at these things that this panel probably can open up that conversation to talk about where are the cogeneration opportunities, where are the, the low-hanging uh, fruits that can be picked uh, that, that really just make sense. And so uh, because these people are much wiser than I, I am now going to turn this over to Matt to elucidate you all. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm Matt Fry. I'm a senior policy manager with the Great Plains Institute. Uh, I'll start off with our, our mission, and it's because we're kind of required to do this, but yeah, we're, we're a small nonprofit organization uh, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we're not as small as we used to be. It used to be six people, and now I think we're about 45 people. Um, <clears throat> our mission essentially is to, to work on things to decarbonize the economy uh, through policy and, and technology. Uh, I do not live in Minneapolis. I actually live in Wyoming. I've been in Wyoming about 20 years. I worked for the state for 18 years, and I've been with GPI for about two and a half. Uh, I've got a history of working on natural resources, energy, and carbon management, and I still work on natural resources, energy, and carbon management. So at GPI, we tend to use analysis to help build out our, our initiatives, uh, use uh, a lot of in information based on data just to kind of move forward our policy and our technology uh, initiatives. I'm going to follow the model of using our analysis and using a lot of pictures to describe uh, some opportunities to actually figure out how you may best uh, develop relationships and may, where you may consider building out these carbon management projects, kind of in the, the, uh, the, the sense of why we're here to talk about this particular panel. So the particular analysis I'll talk about is one that we did a few years ago on carbon and hydrogen hubs. Uh, we did this because the federal government provided about $12 billion uh, in incentives to build out carbon and hydrogen hubs. So we used a series of geospatial data to figure out where they may make sense to build out. Uh, this first slide, like I mentioned, I use a lot of, we use a lot of pictures at GPI to make things easily consumable. I would say this slide is not easily consumable, uh, but what it essentially means is, you know, there's opportunities to utilize the hub uh, uh, structure to build out projects that reduce capital requirements, uh, improve environmental quality uh, issues, and just kind of make the, the project build out in a more efficient way. So for the conversation today, um, we're talking about decarbonization. If you're doing that, you're looking at how to reduce your uh, emission profile, uh, make things less carbon intensive as they go out of the stack. So if you're looking where to site a project, uh, the first criteria you may look at is where your emission sources are. Uh, we tend to look at emission sources that qualify for the 45Q tax credit just because those are going to be the first movers. There's actually a cash incentive to capture that CO2 and to uh, store it permanently in the ground. 
ground. And just so folks know, uh, those circles there are where we're gonna end up. So you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we move through this. Uh, once you figure out where potential opportunities for capture are, uh, the next thing that you, makes a lot of sense to look at is where your geologic formations are. I think no matter which analysis you look at, we're going to have to capture and store a lot of CO2 if we're gonna meet our climate objectives, like in the millions and billions of tons of CO2. So if you can actually cite your project, uh, no matter whether it be you know post-combustion, uh, retrofits, uh, DAC, or if you're looking at opportunities for, for fuel switching, no matter what you do, if you, if you develop that project in a location that's close to a minimal ge geology, uh, you may save yourself some heartache because it's really hard to build pipelines right now. Uh, I included this slide just because we're talking about uh, decarbonization. Uh, if you want to look at opportunities for, you know, as I mentioned before, fuel switching, uh, we look at where existing hydrogen and ammonia production are now. There's also some pretty low hanging fruit for CO2 capture associated with, with these facilities. This is a busy slide, but I think it's pretty important. Uh, as the last panel talked about, low carbon, I hate zero carbon, so I'm gonna say low carbon intensity electricity is uh, pretty important as we develop these DAC and, and uh, low carbon intensity projects. So that makes a pretty high, uh, it's pretty important when folks are looking at opportunities and locations for siting. I'll talk now a little bit about linear infrastructure. Um, so we've got a, two plus million miles of, of pipeline infrastructure across the country today. Uh, you know, natural gas, uh, crude oil, uh, CO2 pipelines. There's two ways to look at the, the opportunities to co-locate along with these, uh, these existing pipelines. First is there's existing right away. So uh, what you see is there's already a disturbance on the landscape. So if you utilize that existing disturbance, you could potentially build out a project with a, a lesser environmental impact. On the other end of the spectrum, there's opportunities to use existing pipeline infrastructure, maybe for a, a low PSI CO2 transport or for a low concentration blending of hydrogen and natural gas pipelines. So uh, another thing to consider when you're looking at opportunities to, uh, to work together on things. I promise I'm getting close. And then the last uh, couple of slides we'll look at is multimodal transportation. I don't think that multimodal makes a lot of sense from an economy of scale perspective when you're looking at CO2 transport or if you're looking at hydrogen transport, but when you're looking at opportunities to bring materials in to actually build these projects, it makes a lot of sense to consider these forms of transportation. So here we look at where the existing railroad uh, distribution are as well as the, uh, the existing uh, truck and barge locations. So those are the interstate highways. Not a lot of barge traffic in the, here in the West, but uh, in places where they're, they are or they do exist, they're pretty important. And as I said, those circles were where we came out on the long run. So we're sitting right in the, the center of an opportunity for a pretty good hub based on all of those uh, physical criteria uh, that we just described. So that's just kind of the, the opening I would wanted to make today to kind of figure out how we may talk more about these opportunities for siting. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe a shift to the discussion. That was very informative. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm Yusha Jami. I'm the Chief Development Officer for Research at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Earth and Environmental Sciences area. Uh, we are one of the Department of Energy's national labs, and we work, our area, the Earth and Environmental Sciences area, have been working on uh, carbon capture and sequestration and, um, and uh, everything um, uh, geosciences for many, many years. So we have a lot of expertise in-house. This specific project I want to talk to you about is the direct air capture hub uh, that we got funded through the Department of Energy uh, this past um, August. We were, um, uh, we um, won this. This is mostly feasibility studies, so I'm going to just walk you through it because it's a little bit unique and different. And since we are talking about uh, partnerships, I'm just going to touch on that. Let's see if this is gonna move. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Okay, um, I mean, this we, we have already talked about this, but I wanted to just 
highlight uh, the importance of it. We obviously decarbonization, decarbonizing the West, we require uh, capturing carbon and removal at gigaton scale. And a lot of that needs to happen in addition to, we have to capture carbon in addition to transitioning to renewable energy and uh, sort of start, uh, uh, reducing an em our emissions at the same time. And uh, a lot of that after being captured, we, what are we gonna do with the gigaton of, um, oh, Okay, uh, no worries, I can handle this. Okay, uh, so uh, when we capture it, then question is what we would do with it. We had the conversation this morning and in the previous panel about, you know, we can obviously use that, uh, use the CO2 in products and different uh, material, or we can sequester it, which is, um, uh, uh, which is another uh, way of uh, putting, you know, reducing it. Now, um, we have been talking to a lot of communities uh, throughout the past year or two and trying to understand why uh, why people are concerned about decarbonization and different modes of decarbonization, especially direct air capture or uh, carbon capture and sequestration, and trying to see if there are some scientific questions or, uh, or inquiries that we need to actually do to make sure whatever we do ends up being um, uh, done right and doesn't have a lot of unintended consequences, then 50 years from now we'll sit down and say, you remember we were talking about that thing? We should have thought about this, 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 this. Um, so uh, obviously technologically we're quite advanced. We can do a lot of these things, but the question is where, how, and what are the different uh, guardrails that we need to put in place to make sure it's done right. Um, the question, uh, obviously the air quality is one of them. Uh, we had a conversation this morning. Uh, pipe Line uh, rapture and the uh, uh, potential cause of that, uh, cause of that, or the health effects of that. Um, a lot of discussions around groundwater. I know we are in a room full of people who are talking about potentially sequestering carbon. But remember, in the rooms that people talk about water, and I'm a water expert, so I tell you, like we sit in a lot of rooms and we talk about how that fossil groundwater that's down, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of miles below ground, uh, can be used as a source. So um, we are double counting a lot of these things and also the question of uh, earthquake and potentially if the injection can cause um, earthquake. Um, the outdoor air capture hub is, um, is unique because we actually started from the community piece of it. We were really interested to see if we, if we bring communities in to the table, have a conversations with them, understand their concerns, can we actually build this feasibility study, not just around the technical concerns we all have, but also uh, social concerns that exist. And in addition to that, the question of who's gonna own all this infrastructure that comes in, how it's gonna be operated, who's gonna gather the data, who is responsible to make sure this data gathering and uh, analysis is done right, and basically making sure that we are doing this in a right way. Um, it's basically a connected hub. Uh, we, are, we have a number of DAC companies that are working with us on this proposal. Um, uh, we have, a, um, uh, we have a solar panel, solar companies, heat company. We have a, a com carbon mineralization uh, unit that's going to work with us. I'm going to talk about all these partnerships. But the most important thing is everybody who's involved in this project knew this is going to be a community-focused effort, knew that they are going to be, that we, we will need to have community support if this project gets done, and they still stayed and wanted to see how we can move this forward. Um, the project basically will have a, uh, we're going to establish a community oversight council that's going to oversee some of the decision making process criteria that are used in life cycle analysis or the environmental impact. We are going to look, as I said, into the ownership model. What kind of business model do we need? Uh, what are the revenue pathways? Who needs to own what? What kind of public private partnerships need to be put in? be put in place to make sure um, we get this done right? And also, um, if the jobs are created, who are going, who's going to benefit from those jobs? Are these going to be jobs that the local community can get involved in? Can we train them to make sure they can actually have a job in their air capture companies or other uh, startups that are coming to the uh, local community? Or is it going to be mostly construction jobs? So, um, you know, sustainable good jobs and, and skilled uh, workforce was very important and it's more than for communities as well. Um, just to show you how this is gonna work, we have a team that's working on the technical side of this, 
the direct air capture piece of it, potential sequestration, and, and how all these pieces are going to connect to each other, and what kind of energy source we are going to use. And we have another team of community experts that are telling us what their questions are, what, are the, what do we need to consider, what are the value systems they, wanna, they want us to incorporate, and also the ownership, permitting, and all those pieces. And these two are not going to happen in vacuum. They're not, while they're happening in parallel, they constantly talk to one another. So whatever we do in the community piece is going to inform the technical analysis. And whatever we do in the technical analysis, we'll have a feedback loop to the community. And the oversight committee will be, uh, would be part of the kind of trying to kind of build this vision and making sure we have the right uh, monitoring, rec reporting, and verification set up, and what kind of transparency we need to put in place. This is a feasibility study, so um, we're not going to build a DAC up now, but by the end of this, if we have done this right, we'll have a very, uh, hopefully, a community-driven and community-informed project that then can go into the design phase and potentially we can build it. Um, just uh, the last slide, these are the um, groups that are involved in this project, we, uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and uh, Berkeley Law um, uh, uh, UC Berkeley is leading this uh, uh, effort. Uh, the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at UC Berkeley is a, is a co-lead. They're basically leading, we are the co-lead. And then, as I said, we have a few companies that are helping us for the analysis, design, environmental impact. We have community groups, and also we have technology providers, a broad range of them that are working with us. And um, with that, I am going to hand it off to Ken. Thank you very much. Um, can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay, there it is. Um, so just very quickly, um, wanted to, uh, by the way, it'll, be, it'll, it'll feel like a bit of a change of pace. I'm here to talk a little bit, kind of be the DAC voice on the panel this afternoon. Uh, I've heard a lot about DAC this, uh, so far today. Um, I'm going to hopefully bring a little bit of a different perspective, although a lot of my talking points, quite honestly, have been taken already, but just, uh, just, just keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to start with a little bit of an introduction of myself, obviously, but also of, uh, of who Global Thermostat is. Um, so I've uh, just recently joined uh, Global Thermostat, just really in the last six months, so I'm really on the steep part of the learning curve uh, in terms of uh, the CCS industry and DAC in particular. Um, I spent the first 20 plus years of my career with a company called Air Liquide, so industrial gases company focused on uh, gas, uh, gas separation technology, uh, essentially uh, you know, spent a lot of time commercializing uh, different aspects of, of what we do or what we did, as I should say, in Air Liquide, uh, both greenfield, brownfield type projects, uh, working with a lot of different stakeholders, obviously collaborating with a lot of partners, building you know, multi-million dollar projects. So fits very well with, uh, you know, kind of the mission, if you will, that I have at Global Thermostat and, and the mission that we, I think, have collectively in terms of bringing DAC forward and, and really kind of building that industry that we've been talking about. Um, uh, I'll, 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 I'll kind of segue over to um, a little bit of a presentation about Global Thermostat. So I'll start from the beginning. I'll, I'll try and move through it rather quickly. Um, so we were one of the first, uh, I, I say one of the early entrants into the uh, into the DAC industry or into the DAC space, right? Founded in 2010, really focused on the chemistry. Uh, we use a also a temperature uh, vacuum swing adsorption system, uh, focused on solid sorbents and contactors. Um, the 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 I'd say our business model and perhaps our, our configuration is a little bit different than what we've talked about earlier today, and we'll talk through that a little bit. Um, but but in general, focus really on the chemistry. Uh, we have a number of uh, pilot plants, R&D efforts. We've participated in, in a number of DOE projects. In fact one that will be uh, shipping out to Hawaii uh, soon to feed uh, CO2 to algae plants, or to uh, algae ponds, I should say. So uh, again, lots of different applications out there for what we do, right? Um, uh, nice, a uh, lot of intellectual property, uh, protected with a nice patent portfolio. We don't rest on our laurels. We're always continuing to try and drive, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about material science and, 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 and amine and sorbent chemistry. We're always focused on trying to drive all of those things forward, right, for the betterment of the industry uh, overall. Um, I'll speak quickly about the five key drivers uh, of DAC. You know, again, we've talked a lot about DAC today, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but um, I'll, I'll speak more from a global thermostat perspective in terms of how we manage these, these components. Um, so as we've talked about, CO2 is very dilute in air, right? 421 parts per million. Um, we have to move a lot of air uh, to get any real recovery of any, any significant volume of CO2, right? Uh, so at Global Thermostat, the way we handle that is, is uh, you know, again, a, a 
uh, air movement system using large, you know, proven industrial high efficiency fans, pretty much what you would see in a cooling tower or any, in, in any industrial facility anywhere in the world. Um, and we move that air through ultra, uh, uh, ultra high surface area contactors. Uh, we use kind of a unique sorbent chemistry, a, a mean based uh, chemistry to capture that CO2 selectively into the uh, contactors as that air passes through. Uh, and then we move that into a, a, a regeneration phase, if you will. Uh, so to desorb the CO2 from those contactor panels where it's collected, sent downstream to either sequestration or utilization application. So there's lots of different ways we can do that. Um, what we, I guess what we kind of pride ourselves on is kind of the physical embodiment of, uh, of what we've built, right? So it's not just the contactors, the chemistry, it's really the way that we've put this moving absorbent bed system together to really cap to really uh, make the, uh, the, the capital efficient system that DAC needs to be low cost and scalable, right? We optimize energy, the regeneration is low temperature steam. It's not a high temperature. We can utilize a lot of waste heat in different industrial systems to generate that steam and that temperature needed to, to to free that CO2 for use, right? So again, um, those are just some elements, but at the end of the day, ultimately what we're trying to create and what we need to drive this industry forward is an inherently scalable platform, right? So we have a couple of different uh, embodiments that we've created. One's our T-series, uh, more of a tonnage, uh, you know, 10 tons per year nominally type system, uh, like the one going to Hawaii that I mentioned, the, the K-series, which is more a thousand tons per year. The picture that you see on the screen is actually uh, a system that we have operational right now over the last year. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting on it last year. Uh, Governor Polis uh, joined us for that, uh, for that ceremony. Uh, uh, along with a lot of other dignitaries and in, in, in uh, industry and academics. And, um, and then we have this M series, which is more megaton, gigaton scale. It's really the industrial climate scale solution that we're all driving towards. Um, each one of these shares the same uh, contactor basic, the same uh, sorbent chemistry and everything else. So that, 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 um, that, that science, if you will, translates very easily from one phase to the next. And again, ultimately where we're driving toward are these large, uh, you know, megaton, gigaton type installations. And that's what we've been talking a lot about here today and, and probably going to be the premise of most of our discussion uh, in this panel. Um, we see the commercial tipping point for DAC being sooner than later, right? More, more one to two or two to three years versus, you know, 10 years plus, which is, you know, again, there's a lot of differing thoughts on that. Um, our business model is an original equipment manufacturer. We want to supply the best DAC technology into the marketplace, into that decarbonization ecosystem. Uh, we want to be a part of the value chain. We're not, we're not going to necessarily be the one to own and operate a system or work with the CDR credits or, or, or you know, uh, really be involved in that way. We'll work with sequestration partners and owner, owner operators and developers, but at the end of the day, we want to be the best provider of uh, DAC technology into the marketplace, which is really what happened in the solar industry back in the kind of early 2000s in terms of finding the best technology, promoting it, and then moving the industry forward. And that's what we want to replicate here. Um, this is our leadership team. Paul Nye, he joined us about a year ago as our CEO. He comes from the solar industry, so maybe it's not a surprise that we're trying to kind of capture that same approach uh, within the DAC industry. And I'll close on this slide. Um, this is, again, this is a facility that we have operational here just, uh, just outside of Denver. Uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, the one where we have our thousand ton per year unit operating uh, for about the last year or so. Uh, more than happy to welcome folks that wanna come out and take a look at it, kick the tires on our technology, talk to our team. Uh, but you know, within a, two a within a really a two acre facility, we're able to take uh, microgram all the way up to kiloton technology and, and test it and, and rapidly move it through that progression to get it to the market. So again, that's uh, what we're all about trying to do and I'll, I'll stop it there so we can get to the rest of the panel. Well, uh, thank you, Kevin. I, that's really the first picture I've ever seen of Governor Polis with a tie on, so I have to say that's, <laughs> that's, that's wonderful to see and how you got him there is amazing. Um, you, you know, I think uh, the, the, what we've described here is really an interesting framework, and I want to just kind of explore a little bit um, how collaborative initiatives can uh, impact technological innovation and, and how can that be deployed within Western states and what the policy framework that really could help facilitate that kind of work. Uh, Governor Polis and I signed an, an agreement um, and we've also worked um, between Utah and New Mexico, Colorado and Wyoming on a hydrogen hub. These are initial steps they've, and I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how we can make that open up more, so. 
pretty much anyone who wants to do it. Um, Nusha, do you want to? Sure. Um, look, I think uh, we talked about this earlier too. It, this is not a technological problem. Obviously, we, we can improve our technologies and do more. Um, but it is definitely a, a, a regulatory and policy need or gap that exists that we need to do. Um, you need to sort of put it together before we uh, start having a successful industry. Um, and also a safe industry, right? Because right now communities, obviously, when, they, when you talk to them, they, they, they sort of, you can tell them this is the technology, this is what it does. They can ask you questions, but they don't know who's in charge, who makes sure that you have, you gather the right data, you have the right um, guardrails in place. You actually earlier mentioned about um, underground storage. Who owns the underground storage? How do you manage this poor space? Uh, what are the different criteria that we need to put in place to make sure if people are start sequestering, um, they, you know, we don't put too much pressure? I mean, we, again, have the knowledge. We just need to make sure there are boundaries set to, to make sure this is done right. And I think um, def definitely policy and governance innovation it needs to move hand in hand as we are deploying these technologies. And I think that's when then you start having more uh, financial security maybe come out, or money flowing in because there is a little bit more confidence in, okay, we know the technology, there are policies, and now we can put, them, put our money into this and get the right outcome we want. Um, so I think, again, one, one last thing I would say also, we also need to be much more transparent. I think this is a new technology. Now we can do all sort of data gathering, right? So we have all sort of technologies that can cap gather data at every part of this process. And we actually have to make sure we leverage those and take advantage of them to make sure we have the, the good monitoring, reporting, and verification system set up that's transparent and makes sure people are, people, and can create confidence in the process. So. Nusha, Matt. Yeah, I, I would just add that like the policy challenges, those are, those are things that you can't model. So when you look at the slides that I presented and the pictures that I presented, those are the physical criteria. So that's kind of where you start when you look at these uh, to, to, to begin these collaborations. But the policy, in my opinion, probably because I'm a policy wonk, but, but the policy makes is really where the rubber hits the road. So when you look at, for instance, the MOU between Wyoming and Colorado, Wyoming is just honestly ahead a bit in the policy game. We have a legal framework in place that allows for storage of carbon. Uh, we have class six primacy, all things that Colorado aspires to and is moving towards. They're just not there yet. So the, the uh, I guess the, the collaboration between the two states makes a lot of sense because one state can utilize the strengths of the other and conversely, I mean, Colorado has a lot more emission sources than we have in Wyoming. I mean, so we can help facilitate some of those challenges for Colorado. So I think the policy perspectives, those legislative frameworks, that's where you really need to dig deep and figure out who your neighbors are and how you can help one another to build out these projects in a more efficient and effective manner. Um, I'll, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll weigh in on it as well, but not so much from a policy perspective. I think as the resident sales guy on the, st uh, on the panel here, I'll probably speak about it uh, from a different perspective. Um, no, I think in terms of, you know, regional collaboration and, and ways that, you know, we can, can kind of work together uh, to, to drive things forward, right? I, I think what regional bodies are really good at in terms of uh, being able to do is, you know, kind of swarm internal resources together, right? There's just a lot more available, you know, especially if you talk about cross-state collaboration and, and, you know, having a bigger uh, bigger group of talent to draw on, right? Just to create those, those, uh, those, those support teams, um, also, um, able to attract external resources as well in terms of in terms of talent in terms of commercial interest lead uh, or, or sorry and, and and really kind of physical resources that might be available um, sharing best practices across teams in, in terms of what's worked what hasn't worked what you know what are we doing over here that's different than maybe how you guys would uh, approach it from a different perspective or, or you know having different resources available um, you know again in developing policies incentives grants tax credits those are all things that I think again we've talked a lot about DAC especially being in kind of a nascent space um, in terms of an industry and you know those are the things that can help 
you know, I, I say it all the time, but kind of help get that flywheel, uh, that business flywheel spinning. Because once it starts to spin and once it starts to get its own momentum, it can move forward on its own, right? Once it's, it just needs the structure, it probably needs some of the support to make that happen in the early days of what we're doing. And I think if we look at collaborating across states, I think there's just a lot of resources that could be pulled together to make that happen. Yeah, and it, you know, it is interesting to me as I think about it, I don't want to take us off too far, but uh, that, that policy framework is so important. You know, we have a multi-state uh, agreement on um, rate setting and, and uh, the challenges, and of course, some of us in the West rankle at California's leadership on some of these issues. Uh, Maury brought up Wyoming's leadership, which was to say um, it, that, uh, you, you know, we have a number of coal plants that are reaching near end of life. They're being depreciated. Uh, we have a lot of renewables that are coming online. They cost money. That requires a lot of grid infrastructure that we don't usually put into the cost of what that development, we talk about it as clean energy, but without all the attendant costs that come there. And, and so really thinking about all of this in terms of marginal cost um, is, is, is something that I wish that PUCs could do a little bit more because um, PSCs, in our case PUCs, generally think about how do we tamp down rate increases for the points Patricia made. Nobody wants to spend more money, but they also want to see regular, you, you know, regular power. They want to be confident about that, and yet all of these things come with a cost. And somehow in that national narrative, we don't talk about that. We talk about clean energy versus dirty energy, um, and, and it's almost this binary notion. And I think if we're going to move forward, we're going to have to build that framework across states. Sorry to do that to you, Matt, but here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll just say I agree 100%. I think the answer's magic. Um, I don't know that we've come up with that. But, I mean, honestly, there is no great answer, particularly when we start looking at, at social pushback and, and real challenges associated with, with personal beliefs and people get emotional about these sorts of things. So, I, I mean, those are costs that we have to consider as well as we dig into this sort of thing. Um, I think, honestly... Let me say this. I think we're not having honest conversations broadly about how to decarbonize just because the things that you mentioned now, they're really hard. People have niches of their favorite technology and their favorite policy. So just blatantly on, I, I think that these are things that need to be discussed more up front and more honestly because we have a lot of work to do and a lot of projects to build. And until we get beyond these conversations and these nine conversations, we're going to really struggle to meet your climate objectives, Colorado's climate objectives, and the national climate objectives. And Kevin, because Nusha was writing lots of things down, I'm going to turn to you. That way she can... <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so she can keep writing. Um, I, I think it's important um, if, you know, we break it into kind of near-term and long-term uh, focus, right? Um, I, I think we, we've all talked about, again, and I'm speaking from a DAC perspective, DAC projects are, you know, Ex, you know, with life expectancies, just like any industrial facilities, you know, 20, 25, 30 years or whatever that might be, um, you know, again, with continued improvement uh, as we move forward in terms of technology. Um, so I think it's important that we, we, we put the near-term policies and, and regulations in place that, that help spur the industry forward, but we also keep in mind that these are long-term investments. They need incentives that reflect that because, again, if we have, if we have support short-term uh, that, that carries an investment horizon out to you know, 10, 15 years, well, that's great, but um, you know, people are making investments on a much longer term basis. And so they need that, you know, again, that security, that risk mitigation uh, that comes with, you know, having a little bit of a, a uh, little bit more support, at least again, short term while we, we get this industry kind of off the ground. And I think that's an important piece of it. Okay, I was, I was writing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I think a couple of things I want to say. One is, um, you know, decarbonization pathways can be very different from location to location, right? And we each state that each one of our states has um, resources that we can rely on and uh, is short in other things that um, uh, we would love to have but don't have. Um, I think decarbonization uh, 
portfolio for California might look very different from Wyoming, and Wyoming might look very different from Colorado. And I think we should acknowledge that we don't need to kind of homogenize this across the board, and we all don't need to do the same exact thing. So making sure we have national policies that incentivizes that diversity of approaches is quite important. Uh, so uh, so I, that that is one thing I wanted to touch on. The second thing is, um, I think you and I had this conversation a little bit outside. I think we have a chance to do a lot of things again at this point in time. And some of that means that we can take advantage of the synergies that exist across the board rather than creating more linear systems than in 50 years from now they're gonna fall apart and we have to do it again. Linear systems are very resource intensive and they're not very efficient. Uh, we have this conversation a little bit like in a second panel about how somebody's waste can be somebody else's resource. And we should actually focus on that a little bit more when we are talking about um, DAC or other renewable, uh, uh, other decarbonization pathways or other uh, carbon capture solutions that exist. Um, for example, I'll give you an example. There is a DAC hub we are working with as part of our, uh, our portfolio um, that uh, carbon six, um, sorry, capture six, that they actually use wastewater as their solvent to capture carbon and they treat and the water gets treated along the way as they capture carbon. I think that's like fantastic in many ways because you are kind of like taking somebody's waste, turning it into a resource and also generating resource after that. So focusing on policies that can incentivize synergies, I think it's extremely important as part of this as we decarbonize. Now, that goes then down to the conversation, uh, the point you brought up, Governor, about uh, infrastructure investment and the rates. The more we, again, going back to synergies and portfolios, the more we focus on synergies, the cost of infrastructure comes down, the, uh, the revenue streams are gonna be diversified a lot more. We will have more opportunities to do multiple things that are that, rather than one single thing. And we certainly in this time and age we are living, we need to kind of uh, focus on multi-benefit solutions rather than singular benefit solutions. So, um, and uh, the, the last thing I would say is going back to that portfolio uh, strategy, um, I think you know, we need to remember the carbonization pathways are not going to be all technological. We need to have a portfolio of nature-based solution and technological solutions all together. We can't put direct air, air capture in every street corner, right? We have a lot of car carbon to capture. So the strategy needs to be multidimensional. So just uh, those are some of the thoughts on this. Yeah, well, there's quite a few. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to open this up to the audience, if that's okay. I've got plenty of questions here, but I, I'm hoping this has spurred a little bit of thought process. And, and so if there are questions, um, now, now would be a great time. If not, I'll go back to my list of questions. I'm not a college professor, but I know how to... <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, great. You know, I think one of the big challenges with regional efforts is, you know, who's the consumer, who's the producer, and how do you balance that in a policy framework? How do you socialize the cost of things that you need to do, and how do we value carbon itself? Uh, we, you know, we have imputed costs that come about well, Southern California, for example, with their floods, and it's attributed to um, climate change and the potential for that, and certainly attributable enough that we see insurance companies unwilling to insure in places like California uh, and insure in places like Florida because of the potentials of that. Uh, that started a few years ago when Lloyd's of London said, you know, this is now going to be an issue. That is a cost to consumers. How do we, because I think most consumers say, well, we just need to get rid of carbon we can do this, but I don't want to pay for it. And so I guess the question that, that I have really is in that entire policy framework. How do we socialize the cost of carbon? Normally people will say, well, let's do a tax. But, but taxes are administration by administration. They don't necessarily work. You've seen that in Australia and other places. 
But if this is something that is going to come forward and is going to be able to support TAC, support carbon capture generally, and support all the kinds of chemistry that need to go in how do we take a carbon waste stream and turn it into useful products, that's going to take, that's going to take investment. So I always do this to my panels, and I apologize. You were all prepared for other questions, <laughs> but, but Kevin. <laughs> sure. Um, let, me, let me take a swing at it. Um, no, I think uh, it's a good point. I mean, socializing the cost of, of carbon capture and the cost of, you know, uh, what, we're, what we all kind of agree needs to happen going forward, and it's, and it's a challenging aspect, right? Um, and and there's, no, there's no clear cut answer. We've all talked about kind of social engagement and kind of socializing, if you will, the message. Uh, I think generally speaking, most people will will say yes this needs to happen as you mentioned but again it's uh, I think one of the prior panels was no one no one wants to pay more for for XYZ for power or for or whatever it might be just to ensure that they have um, you know to, to to say that they're now supporting a, a cleaner greener type approach to the environment or, or, or climate long term uh, some will not all um, so in that framework um, I think it's it's obviously it's about the education it's the outreach and it's it's kind of socializing it you know more broadly than then, you know, just say, you know, these kinds of conversations are great, uh, but to really push that out to the broader uh, uh, broader kind of consumer, if you will, and, and ensuring they understand the basis for everything that we're talking about and why it's important. Um, but it also goes back, you mentioned consumer versus producer. Um, kind of goes back, at least in my mind, to, you know, if I think of it from a project perspective, and I, I know that's kind of bringing it down a little bit more, uh, a little bit to a tighter discussion topic, but, um, you know, how do we model these these types of projects, right? How do we model the cost of carbon, you know, the voluntary offtakes, that, that market continues to evolve, the price of the technology in terms of what it costs to capture a ton of carbon that's critically important, but that continues to evolve. So all of these things are dynamic and they will continue to be dynamic for a long time to come. But again, what we're asking people to pay today may be different than what we're asking them to pay 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. So I think it's an evolving message, um, but again, I think it, it's one that needs to get out to, you know, again, a broader audience and it needs to be repeated. You know, it needs to be a conversation that continues to happen. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Very good. Anusha, anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't run as long as it lasts this time. Um, I think, uh, you know, Ken is right. I think uh, education is a very important part of this. I think incorporating communities as part of this transition process is going to be super important. When people are more involved, they're more willing to pay. If something is out of mind, out of sight, it's harder to kind of justify. Um, people don't think about it. They don't know what it takes. They you know, so it's very hard for them to value it. I think more and more the insurance issue is a huge issue for us in California. More and more that's, you know, socializing that with, to people, like how, and the fact that people are struggling to get insurances or actually the cost of insurance has gone up so high that it's very difficult for them to, um, to uh, pay for it makes them to think about the sources of carbon. Like how can we actually, it's not just capturing carbon, how can we reduce our carbon footprint in other ways? So I think we need to tackle this both at the source and at the, you know, uh, the, like capture, sort of uh, the different capture technologies that can come in place. One thing I want to say also, I think you touched on something very important, which is who's a producer, who's a consumer. Maybe I think about this a little bit at state to state. Um, you know, we definitely don't want to end up cleaning one state, polluting another one. We just want to make sure the policies that we are putting is protecting everybody at the same time. And at the same time, people are paying for it and also feel, okay, if, you know, I don't think, for example, one state should pay and then their carbon ends up in somebody else's backyard. Um, so how can we make sure this is, this is done right and this doesn't end up cause, costing uh, uh, too much for some of the communities is also quite important. So it's kind of like the cost of unintended consequences that we are not capturing right now. Thank you. Matt? Yeah, I'll just add quickly. I, I, th I think the easy answer from a policy perspective is a tax, right? Everybody knows the easy answer is a carbon tax. It's just, and even some industry folks are saying that's the way to go, but it's just not politically palatable and it's not going to happen likely in the near term, if ever. So we need to figure out a way to make this a market. Um, Glenn and I had these conversations years ago. I think Wyoming was kind of on the forefront, you know. We'll build it. You bring your stuff here. We'll charge you to store it here that, with that sort of model. like. 
I think states have a real opportunity to show that sort of leadership. What happened under Glenn's leadership, honestly, was we had that mentality. The market kind of developed itself, and now we have a, a market that's sort of starting to establish, and hopefully we're going to build some projects. I think there's ways that other states can follow that model and develop a market, but without the, uh, without the backdrop of a tax, we're going to figure out how to make a market and make some money out of this to, to actually make it develop. Well, and I, I would I would agree with you. I think that's that's terrific. Um, so, you know, a couple of last questions. Um, one is uh, we we really talk about the West being a leader uh, in in sort of promoting this technology. Kevin, uh, um, with global thermostat, it really a manufacturer of of, of equipment to to make a to make a dent globally. You know, the West of of our nation can make a small contribution. But one of the biggest challenges is what you're going to see overseas. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've got countries that are, that are developing now. You've got countries that are pretty well developed. Uh, and as a friend of mine says, poverty has never been a good thing for the environment generally. So the challenge, it seems to me, is how we engineer the technology, how we build the policy framework, and how we can then export that to the other to the other parts of the world. Not to go off on a wild tangent, <laughs> but I just do this on a regular basis. You, you know, it really does feel to me like the things that we can do here can be incredibly valuable to our local economy, but very worthwhile to the global environment. Mm -hmm. And um, so, Again, Kevin, just because that's sort of your bailiwick, let me sure. let me turn that over to you. Um, so, so just very quickly, um, maybe just to provide a little bit of perspective, and I'm sure uh, uh, the, the folks from uh, Heirloom and Carbon Engineering would echo this. Um, you know, we, if I look at, and again, I've, I've only been on board for you know, and in this industry really for a short time, relatively speaking. But just what I've seen in growth over the last, uh, let's say, six months, and, and what we've seen, I guess, collectively over the last uh, you know five to ten years, has been tremendous in terms of just again a growing momentum in this space. Um, if I look at uh, kind of our, uh, our, our sales pipeline, our opportunity pipeline as we sit right here, um, you know, a lot of it is in North America, a lot of it in the U.S., Western states. We, we have MOUs, we have projects developing, we have lots of good conversations happening on all fronts. Um, but we also have opportunities that are, that are developing in other countries. You know, it's Spain, it's Denmark, it's Norway, it's, uh, it's Australia, it's New Zealand, and, you know, Asia, and you just kind of go down the list. So there's, there's worldwide a lot of interest and a lot of momentum, again, in what we're doing here uh, in this space. You know, the West... Uh, and let's say the West will end up probably, not necessarily the Western U.S., but the West, if you will, will end up probably being the leader in this space for the foreseeable future. But there are a lot of others that are, that are very engaged and, and want to uh, are, are very hungry to pull this technology into uh, their countries, into their industries, and, and really start to stand this up more and more going forward. And, and it's just, it's, uh, I, I'm excited to be a part of it. I think there's a lot of runway ahead of us in terms of what we're doing and what we're building. So being being a bit shameless in the in the in the uh, proposal here, J.P. Morgan has recently put a lot of money into carbon, uh, uh, and and it mostly is in Norway. Um, same with Microsoft, um, and and so the opportunity set really is here. If anybody's listening, uh, and 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 appreciate that Google being here as well, um, and I do want to put a shout out to Project Bison. I think this is exactly the sort of opportunity set that, that can, you, you're really talking about direct air capture in Sweetwater County, um, and uh, it is adjacent to an airport, it's a small airport, but sustainable aviation fuel is a piece of that. Uh, Cogeneration uh, is an opportunity for all kinds of uh, uh, other industries to come along, Simplot is nearby, um, and, and so I think, you, you know, finding those kinds of pieces the, the private-public partnership really can make a big difference. And Matt, I know this is an area that you've kind of looked at when you were kind of working with Glenn. I didn't know if you wanted to expound a little bit on those kinds of opportunities. I think there's incredible opportunity when you look honestly at what we've done with the ITC and other things. Those are tremendous. They're 100% public-private partnerships. and. 
without those public dollars and those public incentives, I think we're gonna struggle to get a lot of these off the ground, you know, thus with the infrastructure law as well as the, the IRA. So um, I'm clearly not an expert in public-private partnerships, but I don't think that we're gonna be a whole lot of headwind in this space unless we utilize them to their fullest capacity. And I would suggest these folks probably know more about it than I do. Well, and I was gonna let Nusha put a bow on everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, we are definitely looking to public-private partnership as part of that um, direct air capture hub um, that we are putting together. And I think it's just, we do nef definitely need public money, but we also need to figure out how these technologies are deployed and where do they fit in into the process and who owns the technology, who operates it, and um, do you hand it off to someone or uh, do you stay on, you know, in place and operate it? So, so I think a lot of that is, needs to be uh, put together. I think, you know, we are, for example, we are looking into, for our own little project, looking into uh, uh, some form of a municipal utility, or not a municipal, it's like a kind of some form of a utility that can be the manager of the, uh, the different flows of carbon, but doesn't necessarily need to own the carbon capture process or any of that. So that's one thing. One, one last thing I want to say on also, you touched on uh, emerging markets, and I want to say, again, going back to my earlier comment, Opportunity areas for each one of these markets are very different. We are much more developed, so we, a lot of these technologies need to have a place here for us to, I mean, as uh, Ken mentioned, you know, the West probably gonna run this because, um, you know, we are, we are fully developed and we have to come up with a way to capture carbon and do other things that we can to minimize our, uh, the effect we already has had. But the, the emerging markets actually have a chance to do things very differently. They can actually build cities that are much more carbon neutral or can generate a lot less carbon or have a less carbon footprint, or they can actually think about modular solutions that can put in place to do multiple things. So again, I wanna make sure, I wanna encourage everybody to think a little bit more about like how we can come up with ways to come up with uh, optimal portfolios for every location we are looking at, because that's the only way we can do this right. Otherwise, we can sort of um, repeat a lot of the, um, uh, the, the advantages that we have had in the past round of infrastructure building in this round. Thank you. Well, let's give a hand to the panelists. And my apologies for taking you off on wild chases. So. <laughs> Jack. Thank you, Governor. Can you guys hear me now? Got it. Uh, a task with a few housekeeping items, but before we go, I just I want to thank, obviously, our, our last panelists here, but all of our panelists for contributing to just a thoughtful and meaningful discussion on, on this issue. It's a critical issue for, for WGA, obviously, uh, as, as embodied by Governor Gordon's uh, initiative. So just can't thank everybody enough for, for providing that insight, and which will certainly help shape our policy recommendations that we'll put forward in the report uh, due out later this summer. So uh, I also want to thank Governor Polis for hosting us this week, and obviously Governor Gordon for join, joining us today. I'll go a little off script too, because you know you you opened the door to, for that. But you know, it, it Governor Gordon truly does embody the WGA spirit and the leadership and stewardship of the West that we, quite frankly, as an organization, wouldn't be able to survive without his leadership and that of his his fellow governors. But I think it's it, it's emblematic that he's here. Uh, it make the time to to travel down I twenty five to to come down, and I think as well as join us in Boise and just to host us up in Gillette. Uh, this has been a, an initiative that he put a lot of thought and energy into, no pun intended, uh, but certainly means uh, a lot to him. And so we appreciate just his stewardship and his leadership uh, on, and holding and convening this discussion. So thank you for that, Governor. And, uh, you know, thank you. It's, it's, it's not always fun to be put on the spot, is it? Yeah, no, it's not. So, uh, no, but really just want to thank uh, our, all of our initiative sponsors and partners for uh, helping making today possible. Uh, and then back to the, uh, the housekeeping items, too. I want to invite everybody to the reception that will be starting just right out the doors here uh, momentarily. 
tomorrow, uh, for those that are joining us, breakfast will be here at 8 a.m., uh, and then we'll kick off our first panel and discussion at 9 a.m. So uh, looking forward to, to seeing everybody. But really just want to thank, again, our participants and, and you, the audience, those that are here in person as well as virtually. Just we couldn't be, couldn't be here without you and appreciate your support uh, for, for the initiative, but also our Western governors and across the West. So with that, looking forward to seeing everybody out there. So thanks again.